OK, so hopefully you've seen from your screens that the recording and the transcription have started. Uh, one of the new features in Teams this week is uh, this year is that the transcription can actually be auto translated uh, as we're doing it. So in theory, if you prefer listening to me in French, you can turn on the French translation. Um, Hopefully I make more sense in French, but we'll see. OK, so we are in the professional computing practice module. So the first thing I want to do is talk about what that actually is. Here we go. Can I just check that everybody can see the, uh, the slides? Or for Scott, yep. to Le Mans. Yep, OK, so let's talk about what the module is and what it isn't, because what it is. Is not technical. So you've had lots of modules that are about, um, <clears throat> I don't know, programming or networking or all sorts of other technical bits and pieces. This one is all about the other stuff. The stuff that um, will actually serve you in good stead for your career, but doesn't really come under the here's how to troubleshoot uh, no notifications on my Outlook app. So it's all the non-technical stuff. Things like legislation, so it won't teach you how to create a website, but it will talk about the sort of legislation you should be aware of to, for example, ensure that you comply with GDPR when you create a website. It won't talk about um, what you should put on that website, but it will talk about the ethical uh, decisions you should be making for the stuff that's on there. You know, that it's, in other words, it's the sort of class that Mark Zuckerberg should have taken before he started Facebook, before he got into all that trouble. So that, that's what we're doing. So it's going to be slightly different from ones that you've had before. Um, but hopefully it will be enjoyable. Now, as you know, it's a short course, so it's worth 10 credits. It's a half module in, in our terms and um, it will finish before Christmas. Um, the themes are split. And as I said, everything is on Moodle from day one. So if hopefully you've all looked at Moodle. Which I have lost, of course, there we go. So hopefully you've all looked at Moodle. And I would suggest that you look at it on a PC because a lot of things are lost if you look at them on a phone or a tablet. And the first thing you'll see is that big red arrow, and it's not pointing at me, it's pointing to all these things that are happening. So if you're ever unsure what's going on, this tells you. So it tells you, for example, that there's a Paisley lecture meeting at one o'clock. It also tells you that your first assessment opens on Friday of this week. Don't worry, it's only a practice one. So we'll talk about what that is. But all the real ones are also there. So your peer assessment opens on Friday. Your professional institutions assessment opens a week on Friday. So all the things are there from day one. Everything that we're doing, including over on this side, all of, <coughs> excuse me, all of the module materials. Now, you won't see some of this stuff. For example, this uh, school assessment board thing, that's results from previous years. So not surprisingly, that's hidden for you. That's just for lecturers. But it will look very much like this, including professional institutions, ethics, laws, and sections on different kinds of law and a final conclusion. So all of the stuff that we are going to cover is all there from day one. How do I know that? Well, this is the introduction. So if I go to the introduction sector, sector, 
section, even. I need a cup of tea. There is the module overview that we are looking at right now. OK, everything is there and you can access it all. Not only should you be accessing it all, you should be working ahead. So this shouldn't be you coming to the lecture and me telling you stuff. This should be you coming to the lecture, you already knowing stuff and asking me the bits that you didn't quite get or want more explanation about. To make sure that you're doing that, Moodle has these things here. These ticky boxes. Some of them are, have got solid squares and some of them have got dotted squares. The solid ones are ones that you can choose. So you can go there and just tick the box on or off to say, yep, yeah, I've done this. The ones with, <coughs> excuse me, dotted boxes are ones where Moodle checks that you've done something. So in this case, it would be opening the presentation. At that point, Moodle will record that you've done it. OK, so I'm going to make sure that you guys are keeping up with this. Part of the reason to do this is because there are so many people in this module. It's core for pretty much every program at every campus. So those hundreds of students taking this on multiple campuses. So this is an easy way for me to look and go who's not uh, taking part. OK, so all the stuff is there. All the information is there. Please, please make sure that you follow it. The Stephen's saying that if you have a brave browser, some of the tracking might cause an issue. I think that's probably a short term thing because the the check boxes aren't cookies as such. They're stored in Moodle, so they're, they're stored along with your profile. It might be a short term thing in terms of updates, but I suspect when you come back, it will be OK. But you tell me, figure it out and let me know. Get interesting to know. OK, so as you saw, a few topics that we're going to be talking about. And when I say talking about, I mean it. This isn't just me telling you stuff. I want you to argue. I want you to tell me I'm wrong and then I'll tell you why you're wrong. And then at the end, hopefully, we'll come up to a conclusion, which more often than not is that everybody's wrong. Those are the best kinds of conclusions. So all the materials are there and they'll cover everything, but that doesn't mean that everything you need is there. All the materials are there from the beginning, but you're going to have to go and do your own research. So again, this is part of the, this isn't just me feeding you information stuff. You have to go and find out things. So if we are talking about professional institutions, well, there's a link to things like the British Computing Society on the VLE, but I can't click the link for you. I can't make you read the website. I can't get you to understand what the BCS is, what it's for, what, it, what it's trying to do. That's down to you. And if you don't do that, then you'll have an issue when we come to the assessments. So you have to read around the topic, not just in the topic. And a huge part of that is talking to your classmates. Mostly online these days. <clears throat> it used to be that I um, would struggle sometimes to kick people out of class at the end because they were still shouting at me and at each other. That tended not to happen when we were online, but um, certainly chatting to each other is a really good thing. Because in the end, you are going to have to come to conclusions on your own because I can't tell you which ethical standards you should conform to. I can show you some ethical standards. I can give you some examples. But in the end, that's going to be down to you guys. <clears throat> so you have to look at the materials, but use them as a jumping off point, because otherwise you won't be able to pass the assessments. Of which there are four. Three multiple choice assessments. So those are on the VLE. Again, they're all there from day one. They are in, and you'll be shocked to hear this, the assessments section. 
So we have three assessments basically covering the three main topics of professional institutions, ethics and legislation. They are 20 questions each and it's one question, one mark. So those of you with a, a mathematical bent well, I've quickly worked out that three assessments of 20 questions gives you 60 marks and that's 60 percent of your overall mark. The other one is a written assessment and that's the final 40 percent. Um, the usual university rules apply. You have to hit 30 percent minimum on each of them and an overall 40 percent. There is more information about that in the student information section. <clears throat> Excuse me. And for those of you that haven't gone through it, if you look on Teams, there's a few channels for the different campuses and different tutor groups. And along the top, there are also tabs. So the tab that I'm talking about is this one here called Student Information. There's a lot of good information in there for this module, but actually more general information. Academic module, resources, staff details, all that kind of stuff. So part of the reason I'm showing you this is under academic information and under pass marks, it gives you a bigger explanation about what the pass marks are, what the grades correspond to and what you have to reach. So basically, all the stuff is in there. And if you ask me a question that's in there, I'll know that you haven't bothered reading the stuff. That's um, a, a living document. So some people do ask me questions that aren't in there, and if they are, I'll add to it as we as we continue. OK, so let me tell you a wee bit more about the multiple choice assessments, because they work slightly differently to the ones that you've seen before. Um, not least because you can take them as many times as you want. If you noticed on Moodle, if we take the first one, for example, and this is a practice one, but it follows the same format, that's why we're there. So the initial practice assessment opens on Friday the 29th at 9 a.m. and closes on Friday the 5th at 5 p.m. So you have one week to do that assessment. And you can take it as many times as you want. I don't care. Take it as many times as you want to try and get the best mark that you can get. Here's the downside. There's lots and lots of questions. It's called a question bank written. There's not 20 questions in there, so you can't just go through it once, write down the answer and hope for the best. Every time you take the test, it will draw 20 random questions from the question bank. Because they're random, you will have seen some of them before, but some may be new. So when you take these tests, you have a choice. Do you gamble or stick. Do you gamble that you can get a better mark the next time you take it? Or do you stick with the mark that you've got? Now, if you take this enough times, if you try it enough times, you will learn lots and lots of questions and you'll probably be able to get 20 out of 20. There's a technical term for that. It's, um, oh yeah, it's called studying. So you can take it as many times as you want, get the answers by, um, by doing it lots of times. 
at which point you'll get a good mark. Jonathan's calling it exam blackjack. I call it the gamification of assessment. So you take it, you take it as many times as you want within that week. <laughs> oh, the gambler, Kieran, I should have started. That's what I should have played, the gambler. Oh, now you're too late now. I'll maybe play us out with that. So take it as many times as you want. What you won't get when you take it is the answer. All you will be told is your mark. OK, now when the assessment's closed, you can go back and look at it and you can see what answers you got right, what ones you got wrong and the correct answers. But while it's happening, each time you take it, the only thing you will get is your mark. So 14 out of 20 or whatever. And at that point, you need to decide whether to take it again or stick. Because what's recorded isn't your best attempt, it's your last attempt. OK, so if you take it and get something worse, that's what will be recorded. If you take it and get something better, that's what's recorded. Each of the assessments works in the same way. The only difference is the jeopardy gets a wee bit hard, higher. So the first assessment is 20 questions, 20 minutes. Second assessment is 20 questions and 15 minutes. Third assessment is 20 questions in 10 minutes. So we're ramping up the levels. OK, just like Space Invaders, it gets faster and you have to get better. Anybody get any questions about how that will work? And the third time, five minutes. Say that again, sorry. If you try the third, the fourth one, uh, try, then you have five minutes or ten. You get ten minutes each time. You get the same amount of time each time. So you could take it for the first assessment. You could take it ten times, but you still get your 20 minutes each time. The time doesn't change. It's only the questions that change because they are random. Any other questions? Oops. Get away from the forms. That's for me to post, not you guys. Quit it. Any other questions about that? OK. So that's the multiple choice part. Then there's a the written part. So as usual, um, written assessment, you will submit that on Moodle and the usual sort of thing applies for turn it in, so it will check for plagiarism. There is a case study that's available. And again, as with everything else, it's available from day one. There's a case study. And there are the requirements. OK, so it's it's about a, a fake company. That has some things have happened to them and you have to create a formal computer use policy for them. The marking scheme is all there. And of course, that links into the topics that we're doing. Professional institutions, ethics, legislation, all that kind of stuff. 
and you get different amounts of marks depending whether you don't do it, do it OK, do it slightly better or do it well. OK, so the stuff is there, the case study is there, the marking scheme is there so you know exactly what you should be doing. The fact that it's done like that means that you can start writing that just now. Do not wait until it's due in. Do not wait till the night before. Start it now and work on it as we go on. OK, so you've got the case study, you've got the marking scheme, and part of the reason you've got the marking scheme is that you guys will be marking this, not me. That's what the peer assessment part means. The idea here is that you guys are in third year. In theory, in eight months time, next May, next June, you guys could have decided that you've had enough. Leave with your degree. I hope you don't. I hope you stay for honours, but you could. And next May or June, you could be starting a job. At which point you sit beside somebody who passes your document and says, what do you think about that? So I want to give you the opportunity to do that in here. I want you to say, this is what I think about that. There's other reasons and they're up on the screen as well, but that's the main one. This is about professionalism. And I want you to be ready to take a job and be professional in that job. So, when you've submitted your report, you will peer assess it, which is to say three students now I've said from your class, that's actually a lie. I've said it already that this module is taking place over four different campuses. So it could be at any campus. So it could be somebody in your class or it could be somebody from Lanarkshire or Dumfries or wherever. Three random anonymous students will read and mark your essay. You in turn will mark three essays against that rubric that you've already seen. So the marking scheme is there. When those are, when those marks are done, your final mark will be calculated. Now, it's not quite as simple as three marks divided by three and that's what you get. Um, I use a slightly different approach. In essence, it's to try and make it fair. So say, for example, two of the people who mark you give you 30 and one person gives you 20. Clearly the 20 is the outlier, so you mark will be up more towards the 27, 28 than it will towards the 22, 23. Okay, so it, it uses some weightings in there. It's not quite a straight average. Um, if you're interested, I can send you a link about how it's precisely calculated, but you can just trust me that I've, I've tried to make it fair. I want to be really clear and I want you to be really clear. Doing this peer assessment is required. If you don't do the peer assessment, it will be treated as non-submission. So even if you write your case study, if you don't do your peer assessment, you will get zero for this. OK, you cannot opt out of the peer assessment. That is part of the assessment. Anybody who goes and looks at the rubric will see that the marks actually add up not to 40, but to 39. The final one is the magic mark that I give. To say, yes, you have done this. So you cannot pass unless you do the peer assessment as well. Anybody get any questions before I move on? Uh, 
I'm keeping an eye on hands. I'm keeping an eye on chat. I'm not seeing anything pop up. How long will you get to do the peer assessment? Natalie, as with everything else in this module, you will get one week. So you will have one week. If you mean the marking part, you will have one week, one week to mark the three assessments that you're given. If you mean the submission part, you've got from now until the time shown in Teams, because again, if you look at Teams and you look at the tabs, one of the things up there is a syllabus that tells you what we are doing. Yeah, OK, you have me in the marking part. OK, that's good, Natalie, thanks. It tells you what we're doing and when. So it tells you when each one starts and ends. So there's a submission for the peer assessment. We then have to give a week's grace because some people may submit it late and I can't find a way around the university regulations to say if you submit it late, I just fail you. But once we're past the late submission, you will have from the 10th to the 17th to do your peer assessment. So you'll have one week to mark those three. OK, so all the stuff is laid out right from the beginning. If you're wondering why I'm showing the week beginning and week ending and why all these things start and Fridays and that kind of stuff, I'm back to the multiple campus thing. So we're on a Tuesday. Uh, Dumfries and Lanarkshire are on a Wednesday. Other classes are on other days, so basically I just leave it to the end of the week to make sure it's it's fair for everybody, to make sure everybody's had the chance to do the things. OK, so everything that we're doing, the dates that we're on and all the assessments are all in the syllabus there. OK, one final twist for the peer assessment. It can be that you disagree with your assessment mark. You might think you've been harshly judged. You might think you've been too kindly judged, although nobody's ever come back to me and said that. So there is an opportunity to challenge your mark. In other words, if you think what you get back is not reflective of the work that you have created, you can complain to the boss. I'm the boss, by the way, if you're wondering. If you do complain, I will read your submission. If you have been badly done to, I will recognise that. I will give you the mark that I think you should have got, the higher mark, and I'll give you another 10% because you were, uh, you understood the value of your work. That has happened two, maybe three times in the last four years. Because the other choice that I might make is that the mark was either fair or actually too generous because it was your colleagues that did it and I would have been less generous than they were. If that's the case, again, I will give you the mark that I think you should have got, but I will take off 10% because you weren't aware of the standard of your work and you've wasted the boss's time. So challenges exist, but be very careful in doing them because you could win, but you could lose. And I think it's fair to say that over the history of this module, more people have lost than won. Anybody got any questions about that part? Uh, 
Um, if you, the question here is how does it go if it's distributed and people don't mark it? It will work in the same way as if um, they did. It will take those who did mark it and you'll get that mark. Um, and again, the calculation will hopefully be reflected of what you did. Because, yeah, some people don't mark it. Not many, but some people do. Any other questions? It does sound like a challenge, yep. No, how can a YouTube podcaster not have a microphone? For goodness sake, that's what you get for tidying up. Yep, Daniel, definitely assessment blackjack. Except I'm the dealer and I always keep the ace up my sleeve. Any other questions just now? Ooh, I bought new hardware, says Stephen. Look at me with my loads of money and my fancy hardware. Yeah, some of us can only afford the UMC22 rather than 202 HD. See the multiple choice tests, so all three of them about all of the slides. Yes, everything that's on the slides is examinable. But everything that I link to is also examinable. So, for example, you'll see on Moodle that the information is in three categories. Core material, supporting material, and not this one, but some sections have additional material. Everything that's in the core and the supporting material is fair game to be examined, David. So it's all the slides and all this supporting material stuff. So I'm expecting you to look at the core material and the supporting material, but anything in these additional material things are stuff that I think you'll find interesting, but there's no questions on it. Is that OK, David? Are there any penalties for improperly marking the assessment? Trust you, James. Um, the penalty is that you'll be haunted by the memory of your misdeeds for the rest of your life. More seriously, if I see a massive difference, so you know somebody gets 39 and two other people have marked them at 15, I am going to look at that and I have failed people before because all they've done is basically gone through the assessment, given everybody full marks and gone away again. That's not acceptable. So if I see that kind of behaviour, that's deemed as not engaging with the module because you haven't actually done what you're asked to do, you have just typed stuff in. Uh, and yes, so the penalty is you'll be marked as no submission, not engaging, zero mark, that kind of stuff. OK, I did see a message pop up that says, is this legal in Scotland? It seems to have disappeared again. Yeah, it is legal. Um, I'm not sure if you want to come back in on that, or why it's disappeared. Maybe I was hallucinating, not sure. OK, I think that's all the questions in the comments. Um, the assessment regime is clearly very different to the ones that you're used to. So actually, one of the things I've done is created a wee questionnaire for you just to reflect on what you think about it so that I can decide whether to persist with this or whether to uh, stop doing it. So that will pop up. It is just a questionnaire. It's not an assessment. You won't be marked on it. It's all it's important for you to understand is anonymous. So you can say whatever you want. 
OK, and if you think I'm an idiot and doing the most stupid thing you've ever heard of, feel free to say that. That's OK. I won't know. OK, so you'll see that pop up in your feed and I'd appreciate if you filled that in. As I said before, you have to engage. Um, this module was actually designed for online use, and that's why we've got the, the engagement stuff with all the ticky boxes. Um, the other thing you have to do is engage in the uh, tutorials. And um, so you have to turn up and you have to um, put in stuff. It was easier in person because we were sitting in a room and we would, I'd be able to see who wasn't, uh, who wasn't actually taking part and I'd be able to ask them specifically. So one of the things we might do is have online things. So you'll see on Moodle there's online discussions and I will be looking to make sure to, um, that you have actually engaged. Speaking of the tutorials, here's a wee question for you. Is that popping up? I don't see any answers. Maybe it's just my screen not been updated. Oh, there we go. No, oh, and James has got new hardware too. Oh. Look at me with my student grant money. I can buy loads of stuff. Like, so I have is, no student grant money at all. <laughs> yeah. Oops. Um, you guys seem fairly clear that it's not professional to miss a deadline, which makes me wonder why some people didn't sign up to the tutorials. Because, of course, that was there. There was a deadline and not everybody signed up. We have yeah, over a dozen people who didn't do it. It's not professional. You're right, of course it's not. And Dylan says it may depend on why you missed the deadline. So give me a good excuse for missing a deadline. While Dylan's thinking about that, Natalie, yep, that was exactly why we were coming here. So those of you who have signed up for the on-campus tutorial, you are in P116 with Don. Those of you who have signed up to Paisley Online Tutorial 1, you are um, with Santiago. And Paisley Online Tutorial 2, you're with Ogo. OK, so Santiago, group one. And it would have been better if I numbered these separately, but group two are going to group three. That's annoying. OK, so group one stays the same. And if you're the other online group, you're with Ogo and me. A house fire, natural disaster, these are examples of where missing a deadline might come into play. They may be, let me suggest that if there was a death of a family member, a house fire or a natural disaster, then it would be at the very least polite to let your employers know. For this module, you consider you can consider me your employer because that's exactly how I'm going to work this module. <laughs> Supply line strategies. Yes, Andrea, Brexit. Absolutely. 
that one I will take. Um, I am about to open up the tutorial groups again. Anyone who has not chosen their group will now have 30 minutes from now to do it. 30 minutes or so. So you will have, what date is this? 26th. So you'll have until half past two. Anyone who hasn't chosen a tutorial group, I will deem as not having engaged with the course. OK, so that's now open again. You'll know it's open because at the top of the screen with the big red flashing arrow, it will tell you about it. Well, it will do if I refresh it. which I can't be bothered doing because I can't remember the key code to refresh. And I can't be bothered taking it to full screen. What's the difference between Paisal Online Tutorial 1 and 2? No difference whatsoever, Netra. It's simply that if we try and have a tutorial where we want people to talk, having 70 people in one room is tricky. So we split up into three different rooms. There is no difference on what happens in there or how it will work. It's just three different rooms. What if I'm connected to two groups? How do I disconnect from one? You can update your choice so you can remove yourself or you can uh, change them. Harry says this was the one that came through the email. I'm not sure what that means. OK, so that was the questions, but you are all asking questions anyway. Will the group choice be reflected in Teams automatically? No, there's no connection between Teams and the group choice in Moodle. There's, I don't have a way of doing it. Teams doesn't let you do it, but Moodle does. So that's why I've shown you the, the connection. So um, online, sorry, on campus is very clearly the on campus one. Uh, online tutorial group one goes to tutorial group one on teams and tutorial group two goes to the other online one do you know something i'm going to change these names because it's bugging me daft and somebody is going to get it wrong so let me just quickly change the name OK, so online group one is online group one and online group two is online group two. And online and on campus is now group three. OK. Group one is group one, group two is group two. All right. To select what group to be in, I had the email to make the choice. Yep, it's the same link. It hasn't changed all I've done is opened up again so that you can do it so either follow the link in the email or go on to Moodle go down to the tutorial group and choose the activity and the tutorials it's a Paisley tutorial group choice so you can just go there from Moodle if you can't find Moodle not so you won't be surprised to know that I've even made that available on Teams as well because one of the things I can do is put Moodle within Teams. So there's also a tab on Teams to load Moodle, so you can find it in there too. Any other questions just now? OK. In that case, that's been the best part of an hour. It's very hard to do things. How can I access to tutorial group? 
do you mean actually turn up to the tutorial group? If you go on to Teams and go into the channel, so in Santiago's channel, he has created Uh, Santiago has created somewhere. OK, do it in your calendar instead. Yes, there is a tutorial meeting today. So there's Santiago's. So it's in the calendar because it's attached to the channel. It's in your calendar. There's Santiago's. And there's Ogo in mine. I've no idea why Ogo is in capital letters there. OK, so you can go to your calendar and the links are in there. Uh, OK, Tianyu, you can find it there. Havo, yes, I think I've just said that. Yes, there will be a tutorial meeting today, definitely. You're not getting out of it that easily. We've only got six weeks. We don't have time to take time off. OK, I don't see any other questions popping up in the chat. I don't see any hands up. So as I said, that's been about an hour. So, so oh, yeah, Matthew, just as we're about to finish, you've been a really long question. God, it's going to take me ages to even read that. Uh, custom of uh, time for each attempt. No, not for each attempt, for each different assessment. So assessment one takes 20 minutes, assessment two, 15, assessment three takes 10. But each different try at assessment one is still 20 minutes. Each different try at assessment two is still 15 minutes and so on. So no, that doesn't change. It just it drops down for each assessment. So the first one, you have 20 minutes each attempt. The second one, you have 15 minutes each attempt. And the third one, you have 10 minutes for each attempt. OK. Uh, the case study on my Moodle is on setup phase. Yes, it is, because if you look at the top of Moodle, you will see that case study opens for assessment on Friday at 6 p.m. So that's when it will move into the next phase. Uh, Paisley Online Tutorial, who is it with? It is with Ogo and me, but mainly Ogo. Ogo, I know you're on. I don't know if you want to um, unmute yourself and say hello to everyone. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. OK, great. Good afternoon. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing um, a couple of you at um, 3 p.m. today. So let's um, try and have fun. Thank you. Right, just to be clear, I don't allow fun in my classes. Uh, other than that, you should be expecting more than a couple. You should be accepting, expecting, if I can find it. There you go, go. You should be expecting 25 people to turn up. Because the first one's full. Dawn, however, is getting an easy day because there's only five of you turning up on campus. Any other questions just now? No. OK. We still have more of the lecture to go, but we will take a short very short break, so let's take five minutes and I'll see you back in five.
OK, and we are back. OK, before I move on to the next one, anybody got any questions that's occurred to them during the break? No. OK, in that case, let's talk a little about the computing profession. I want to talk about it, my computer doesn't. There we go. So let's have, uh, as I said, this is about non-technical stuff. Um, and it's called professional computing practice. So I suppose the first thing we want to think about is what actually is a profession? Um, what makes something a profession rather than a job? Anybody want to suggest anything? A job is a means to an end, but a profession is, yeah, prolonged training and qualifications and kind of ongoing commitment to a um, of some some task that you do. So uh, a job is something that you can take up and drop, uh, but profession is something that's long term. So that's a reasonable yeah. start. So I suppose then the question becomes, you're in computing. So is that a job or a profession? I should do my line of duty bit here and say for the benefit of the tape, people are now voting in an online poll. So we're currently roughly 95% profession, 5% job. Scott thinks professions are regulated. Kieran's on the fence. And Matthew thinks that woodworking is a profession. That's an interesting uh, claim. Robert doesn't think it's a job or a profession, it's both. And David says it depends on the specific role in computing. I like David already because a large part of what I'll be saying to you in a lot of my modules is, yeah, it depends. And it probably does depend. So we'll stay in roughly about that 95, 5% for profession over job. So I suppose one of the things we should be thinking about is um, what makes something a professional. Matthew thinks that profession implies some sort of craftsmanship. Craftsmanship's an interesting word because yeah, you don't become a woodworker or again, there are, there are levels of woodworker, but we'll talk about I, I can a more say a cabinet maker you don't become a cabinet maker overnight it's something that you have to spend time on at least to get to any sort of decent level of proficiency jamie thinks professions are broad term so you in a some sort of sector Famous is hedging his bets, thinks it's both. Oh, that's an interesting one. Scott says your profession could be computing, but your job is at UWS. Am I in the computing profession? Am I in the academic profession? 
Am I neither? And I'm just turning up here because I've got nothing better to do on a Tuesday afternoon. First line help desk. Presumably on the basis. Well, I'm not sure why is first line help desk a job and not a profession, Kieran, or anybody else? Because it doesn't require as much training and qualifications. OK, so that's bringing on some new things. It might be not just about time. It could be about training or qualifications. Training and qualifications, of course, are different. You can have lots of training, but not be qualified. Daniel says a job's earning money. Cameron says if he's been so that but if he's been paid money, he's a professional. So Tiani and Cameron are opposing ends. A profession is a spirit. I quite like that idea that a profession is a spirit. I like the idea that it's something inside you that um, you have to do rather than need to do. I'd be inclined to say that anything can be a profession if you work hard enough at it. Just because it's just because it's not necessarily skilled doesn't mean it's not a profession. That's an interesting point, because your attitude can be professional, even if you wouldn't normally think of the job as being a profession. Um, I don't know. Can we agree that uh, being a refuse collector is a job rather than a profession? If we can, then refuse collectors can still be professional about how they do their job and do it to the best of their ability. So perhaps part of profession is your attitude, is your approach to what you do. Which is why I asked the question earlier about um, whether you thought it was professional to miss a deadline. Because it is about your attitude, it's about your approach. Cocktail specialists, a profession, barman pulling paints, a job, that's interesting. Professionals, what you're good at. I, mean, I would say a uh, profession doesn't require certification. A good example would be like a tattoo artist. So they obviously have mastered their art. I would class a tattoo artist a profession. So you don't need certifications or that for that. What about then a portrait artist? That's what I mean. Do they require a certification to be a professional? No. Is it maybe a different thinking when it comes to like art based stuff though? Like um, I'd maybe be okay with a tattoo artist taking a picture of an artist to tattoo onto me, but I wouldn't be happy with my doctor attempting that. You know what I mean? <laughs> you realize there are tattoo artists in the NHS? And they're very highly trained professionals. I didn't say everyone, Tony. I mean, I'm not saying all doctors would be bad tattoo artists. <laughs> I refer you to my earlier comment that it's my job to disagree with everybody. But there are tattoo artists in the NHS. Many doctors are qualified tattoo artists for good medical reasons. It's uh, David thinks that if you're self-taught and have a portfolio, you don't need qualifications. He's saying that about art, but that point could be made about pretty much anything, I'm guessing. If enough people think that you're good at what you do, you may get yeah. work. You can say that about a programmer, absolutely. Cameron is asking if Gordon Ramsay is a professional, clearly not. Jonathan's reminding us that you can't just start up as a tattoo artist, you do actually need to be licensed. Wait, I'm sorry, you just said Gordon Ramsay's not a professional. I'm curious to why you consider that. I agree with David. If I came on to this, oh, sorry. 
I came onto this lecture and started shouting and swearing at you. Would you think I was being professional? No, but the context of a kitchen is usually different to the context of an academic environment. OK, so it's about context. So what context makes it acceptable to verbally abuse someone? I would say it was acceptable, but I would say that like, you know, as somebody who's spent time in kitchens it is like common practice in that profession. Common practice and professional are not necessarily the same. That, and that doesn't mean it's good either. Definitely. Doesn't it make it right? Or right, yeah. I'm not saying, I'm not giving it a morality. I'm just saying that it doesn't stop him being a professional in his profession just because he chooses to be very ineloquent in his words. And you're making that point, and there's other people disagreeing with that point, saying that it's not just the bit that he is presumably good at cooking food. It's the whole thing. Professional isn't just can you cook food, it's do you act professionally in the whole environment. Kyle's making an interesting point is that uh, professions might be a, that you reach an advanced level, put a lot of effort into, which kind of echoes Matthew's point about putting time in for a woodworker or whatever. Um, some people, yes, are recognised as professionals because of what they've achieved. And as an example is the guy that came up with Python, the dictator for life at Python. I suppose there's a question about whether if you call yourself a dictator for life, that's also professional. Guido Van Rossum is the guy we're talking about, if you're wondering. Cameron's saying if your job can uh, mean that someone dies. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're professional. I'm not sure what point you're making there, Cameron. Um, if someone puts another life at risk, I think it should be acceptable to shout at them. Is that the case in a kitchen? Is somebody's life at risk? Oh, that's interesting from Jamie. A profession is what you are, the job is what you do. Oh, Matthew's got a, a dictionary definition from somewhere, I'm guessing. OK, all good answers. Um, and we've touched on some of these things here. Is it about gaining specialised knowledge, which might take a, a long time to get? Um, have they prepared to do it? Is it something you just turn up? Um, I mentioned a refuse collector earlier. I imagine there's some training involved in hooking a bin onto a bin lorry and pressing the button and keeping out of the way while it empties. But I can't imagine it's like four, or four years study. Which isn't to say I would want a, the life of a refuse collector. I don't fancy being out in all sorts of weathers doing a lot of physical work. I think I'd last about a week. But I don't know that it's a profession. Because maybe there's not enough preparation needed. <laughs> A profession's a class and a job is an instance of that class. Maybe it's the other way about. Maybe the job is a class and the profession is an instance because there's more required for the profession than there is for the job. Job extends profession or does profession extend job? And Bradley's quite right that that is only a small part of the job of a refuse collector. And um, I think what we're doing is, is hitting my limits of what does actually happen rather than trying to pretend that refuse collectors don't do an awful lot more than that. 
Um, so what makes you professional? Is it about knowledge? Is it about technical uh, excellence? And I don't just mean technical in terms of computing, I just mean technical that you know about your subject and, and are, are clear on it. Is it about ethics? Is it about what you would and wouldn't do? So, um, is there something more than just knowing how something works? It's about whether you would actually um, do it or not. Let's, okay, so rather than trying to define a profession, here's another poll for you. So there's half a dozen things there. Lawyer, plumber, cleaner, accountant, mechanic, doctor. So you can choose as few or as many as you want. Which of those do you think is a profession? All fairly similar so far. The only one that's falling behind is cleaner. But most other answers are roughly the 17 to 20 percent. Yeah, cleaners are falling behind again, only 6 percent. OK, so if you think a lawyer is a professional. Stick something in the chat that tells me why lawyers are professional. Or oh, come on, Mike, whichever way you want to do it. Especially those of you who spent a fortune on brand new mics or finally got them plugged in. I don't even know if it sounds right. You don't need to tell me, to be honest. I've not checked levels or anything. I used my five minutes just to get the cables in. No, it's pretty decent, actually. So do you want to know if these think if these people who do these jobs are professional or whether the thing itself is a profession? The latter. OK, in which case, yes, a lawyer is a profession. Because if the extent Why? to which it requires um, study and work and time and effort and um, a prolonged specialization in a specific uh, type. Okay. So we've got that. training, mm -hmm. Scott's put regulated in there. They have professional bodies. He wins back to knowledge. And they need to protect the basic rights. So that comes under ethical. People don't see a cleaner as profession based on their own higher standards. Absolutely, we couldn't get we couldn't get we couldn't move without cleaners. We just couldn't. Um, on the other hand, people can just become a cleaner. People can't just become lawyers, as Kyle points out. Jonathan's also saying that there's lots of different specialisations. You're not just a lawyer. You can be an IP lawyer or a defence lawyer, or a, I think we're hitting my my limit of law knowledge at that point. But there's lots of different types of lawyers. Um, all of them, there's no difference, says Georgia. Oh, a crime scene cleaner. So we're now differentiating between different types of cleaner. Crime scene cleaners are profession. Somebody's been watching BBC on a Friday night. Um, depends on what's been cleaned, toilets or expensive homes. I'm not quite sure if I follow that argument. I don't know if you're cleaning something, you want to clean it, and if you're being professional about it, it won't matter what it is. Um, toilets and expensive homes, exactly. Um, Daniel's back to training. Famous says it's all about getting a degree. I'm not sure it is all about getting a degree. Certainly it's part of it. I'm not sure it's the whole thing. Okay, 
So you're pretty much a profession for lawyer. So tell me why that's the same for a plumber. Because you're talking about all these years of, of uh, preparation to become a lawyer and the professional standards. How does that fit in for a plumber? I think that might come into regulation because you just you don't want anyone playing about with gas in your house and so forth. Not to say that's the type of plumbing they might be doing, but it's one of the options. So a lot of plumbers move towards gas fitting. There's a lot of the same skills involved, and you're right, it is far more closely regulated and a lot more training involved. Kyle's got a good question that I'm actually not going to address at the moment because I think we'll come back to that. Um, more about the way you carry yourself. You have to learn plumbing. You know, plumbers, again, require a lot of knowledge. But when someone says plumber, is your first thought somebody that you can trust? Is it even, oh yes, if I phone them up, they'll be in and I don't need to worry about it. Things will be absolutely fine. And compare that with what you think about for a doctor. There's lots of different aspects to this. We're kind of, I think everybody's kind of agreed that it's about training and preparation. Um, what we haven't really touched on is it's also about updating that knowledge. Um, I like to think of myself as a professional, but if I hadn't updated my knowledge, I'd be sitting here teaching you about Fortran and COBOL not anything else. So it's about keeping up to date. If you're a lawyer, you keep up to date with um, new laws as they're created. If you're a doctor, you keep up to date with new techniques and new drugs. Why should it be any different for those of us in computing? Why shouldn't we be keeping up to date with new approaches, new ways of doing things? David's saying if you don't update your knowledge, you may become obsolete. It's actually really fun and sadly easy to find job adverts where they'll want things like, um, they'll say things like you must have five years experience in language X, where language X has only been around for two years. It's always good to, to, to find those ones. So it's about training, it's about updating that training to stay up to date. It's about standards. And the question then probably is, who sets the standard and whose standard are you keeping? Um, more fuzzy things as well. What do I mean by duty of care? Responsibility. Responsibility, yep. If we talk about the plumbing thing, if you ask a plumber to come in and, and fit a new boiler and they're not, and they don't have the qualifications to do so, you don't expect them to go, yeah, I'll give it a go. Why should it be any different for us? If someone asks you to fix a COBOL program and you've never seen COBOL, do you just go, I no bother, give me the cash and hope for the best? Or do you say, well, that's not really in my skill set. If you want me to do that, it's going to take a wee while. So you have a duty of care to the people that you're working for, your clients, the people that you're creating work for. But you've also got a duty of care to your employer to say, yeah, no, I'm, that, that's not my skill set. And sometimes there can be a conflict there, which can require some resolving. Because your employer might want you to take on work that you know that you're not qualified for, but they want the cash. So you have this back and forth between your employer and it could be a self-employment because you want cash if you're self-employed too. 
and what you can actually do. It also means providing the best thing that you can, because anybody can run in, quickly create a program and run out as fast as your wee legs will carry you. Doesn't mean it's a good program, doesn't mean it's properly documented, it doesn't mean it'll work for a while. Um, it doesn't mean any of those things. And the other thing you should know about is the legislation. Lawyer or not, you should know about the legislation. If you if you have a client who wants to create a website, you should know about GDPR. Because if you don't, how are you going to advise your client and how are you going to set up that website to make sure that you're not breaking any of the GDPR rules? So we are starting to add to all these things. These aren't just things that um, are special to what you do. They are not specifically technical things. It's a whole hinterland of all these other things that are around. People have tried to codify these, including an organisation called the BCS, the British Computing Society, who have a code of conduct. And I have shown that code of conduct. It's linked from Moodle as well, but I just I know that I copied it in here, so it, I thought it was going to be quicker. I'm not convinced all of a sudden. Yeah, my computer's just really slow today. So the BCS have a code of conduct. And it talks about your integrity and your ethics as an IT professional. And when you sign up to the BCS, you say that you're going to be uh, living up to those standards. The same kind of standards that lawyers and doctors and other professionals live up to. So there's a whole big multi-page code of conduct that says that you work in the public interest and that you work with integrity and that you have duties to whatever authorities that you're working under. You get a duty to the profession. The idea being that if you do a bad job, that gives everybody in computing a bad job. In the same way as you call up a plumber, plumbers have a bad reputation because lots of plumbers don't call you back or don't come up when they say they will or all that kind of stuff. So there's a whole sheaf of things that you're supposed to do as part of the computing profession, or certainly as a member of the BCS. Because part of the problem we have is that we are trying to turn computing into a profession, but we're not quite there yet. Other professions are clearly professions. Doctors are a profession. And they're a profession in part because they have these codes of conduct. They've had them for millennia, which isn't an exaggeration. Primum non nocere. And I know that there's so many Latin scholars out there that I don't have to translate that, but you have all heard it. It's a Hippocratic Oath. First, do no harm. The first thing a doctor has to agree to is don't hurt somebody. But as Harry correctly points out, sometimes doctors do hurt people. You don't have to walk into a, a chemotherapy unit to see that. But the good outweighs the bad. So the temporary short term harm, you know, a surgeon taking a big knife and gutting you like a fish. The temporary short-term harm and the recovery from, for that has a long-term positive benefit.
Doctors have these things. Lawyers have these things in part because how can we judge a doctor? How do we know that the doctor has done the right thing? Could you reliably say whether or not the treatment that a doctor recommends for you is reasonable, is good, is appropriate? I couldn't. I don't have the training for it. So what we have to do is rely on other doctors to do that. Anybody who's ever watched any um, TV medical drama will have seen, oh, can't remember what they call them. Somebody dies, they have a, they have an inquiry. Why did somebody die? Could they have done something differently, something better, something in a different way? So doctors police their own. Lawyers police their own. What we want to get to is the point where computing people can police their own. Morality and ethics do come into that, Kieran, absolutely. You can't cut somebody open like a doctor does without having morality and ethics come into it somewhere. Even in a less uh, obvious case, a lawyer has to work for the benefit of their client. You can't have, or you shouldn't have, for example, a lawyer working for both the prosecution and the defence. You can't work both sides of it. Choose one and do your best for them. Most professions are held to a responsibility which varies between roles. That's true. So there are different levels. You don't start and become a doctor. You start and become, and again, I'm going to hit my limit of knowledge here. You become an intern, then a resident, then a consultant. If not, there are similar sorts of steps. So as you gain knowledge, as the people around you check and make sure that you're not killing people, your responsibilities go up. And hopefully part of the thing about being in a profession is that Harry's worry that corruption would overtake the honesty doesn't come to bear because we are putting a lot of trust in these people and assuming that they are being honest in part because we don't really know whether they are. Robert's talking about um, good and bad again, talking about lawyers lying for a good cause. Now, lawyers can't lie. At least they're not supposed to. But they can omit. They can choose a different point of view. And David's right, if you want both sides, you'll always win. What would a corrupt computing professional be like? Um, I'm guessing they'd be like somebody who starts Facebook and allows all their data to be stolen. But that's just a personal view. And don't sue me. Sounds like a politician. Um, somebody's put John McAfee in there as a corrupt computing professional. Now, there's two different parts to that. Was John McAfee corrupt? And was he corrupt in what he did in computing? And I suggest there might be different answers to that. If you don't know who John McAfee is, go look him up. Some of the replies won't be safe for work though, so just be careful. OK, 
Kieran's reminded us that um, when Google first started, their one and only guidance was don't be evil. I think that has gone. There's some good comments in there. If you're not following along in the comments, please do. There's a lot of good comments popping up there. OK, so we're starting to get this idea that there might be something a bit more to a profession than a job. It's not just something you turn up to and hope for the best about. Something you might need training for, something you might want to think about how you um, how you approach it. So was oh, somebody's opened this already, haven't you? This is the one you did. Now is the point I was going to ask you if computing was a job or a profession. I think it's appeared for you guys. Hopefully I've managed to fix that. If not, my apologies. So. We have this idea that. There are professions. Lawyers, doctors. And part of the reason they're professions is because they self police. Computing isn't like that yet. And I emphasize the yet. You can just turn up and say, hello, I'm the computing person. Someone put that into the chat earlier. There's no qualifications. There's no anything really required. You can just decide that you are a computing person. So the question then becomes, is that a good thing? Are we OK? With. People saying, yes, we are computing people. And one of the things that we're trying to do is trying to move computing into that kind of area where it's recognized very much as a profession and not just a job. And we're clearly not there yet. That is what we'll be talking about next time. And I mean talk about it because you guys will have read about it in advance, won't you? Yes, Tony, we will. You'll have read all the materials and thoroughly digested them, won't you? Yes, Tony, we will, because we are professional in our jobs. In the meantime, don't forget what's coming up. There's two um, what we call formative assessments. So there's in the academic profession, we talk about formative and summative assessments. Formative assessment is one where you try and figure out um, whether you're ready to take the summative assessment, which is the one that counts and the one that's recorded. So because you guys are doing this in a slightly different way, we have two formative assessments. We've got one here for the multiple choice. So that's the initial practice assessment. And then we've got the case study practice peer assessment. I'm guessing your um, multiple choice one you'll be fine with. You're all computing people. For this one, you go to the practice assessment. It will look slightly different for me than it will for you because I'm seeing it as staff rather than as student. But in essence, you will have things like this. So you'll get a timer up there, tell you how long you've got. And you'll have questions. I am not even reading these. I'm just popping 
answers in. OK, so you put them in. You give answers. Submit them. And then it will tell you. Once you've finished, so it gives you an option over here, it tells you. Um, whether or not you've answered them so you can make sure you don't miss any out. And then once you submit them, it will come back and tell you your mark. So it tells me I got four out of ten. What it hasn't told me is which ones I got right and which ones I got wrong. OK, so that's how the, the real ones will work. I think I've actually set up that the real ones is one question per page, so you just do one at a time. So I need to change that. OK, but that, uh, any questions like that? Hopefully that's not too out of your, your normal wheelhouse. I'm really glad that all these comments are going on in the background, by the way, while I'm talking about this stuff. This is great. OK, so that's the practice assessment, the formative assessment for the multiple choice. There is also a formative assessment for the case study. Attached to that is a dummy file, just in case you can upload any file. The peer assessment one is slightly more complicated. We're currently in setup phase, as someone pointed out earlier, because it doesn't start until Friday at six o'clock which point we are in submission phase. So you'll submit a file. Submit any file, it doesn't matter. OK. You have a week to submit the file and then we switch to the assessment phase and that's when you'll see what you get out. So you'll get three people, their work, and you can uh, mark it. Once that phase is done, so again, you get that week. Um, it will then be graded and you'll get a final mark. I'm not expecting you to upload anything. That's why there's a dummy file. If you even want the dummy file, upload anything, it doesn't matter. I'm not expecting you to actually mark it. It's just to give you an idea how this uh, process works, because I suspect most of you won't have done this one. OK, so it's just a practice. I'm actually not even going to look to see if people have done it. But I will look in five weeks time if somebody asks me, how does this work? And I'll check to see whether you did the practice one. OK, so it's really helpful. I would suggest you definitely go through it. Why four out of ten? Because that was the mark I got famous. I just put in answers and it marked it for me. The computer will mark it for me. No one else needs to get into it. So this Friday's peer assessment is just a test of that window. Yep, so it will open up on Friday the 29th. We'll then have a week to submit it and another week to evaluate, just as it would be for the normal one. The only thing is you don't actually have to. Again, I'm not going to go over all those comments in there. You're all making very good points and you know what you should do. You should argue them in the tutorial. That's exactly what the tutorials are for. OK. Um, we have discussed these sorts of things. Um, and now you can go and shout at each other in a tutorial. And we'll be there to tell you that you're wrong at every step. Trust me, no matter what you say, you'll be wrong. Pavel's asking if they start at the same time. Yes, they all start at the same time. So they start after this. What I'm going to do is send a message to all the tutors because I'm going to give you 20 minutes between this finishing and the tutorial starting so that you've got a break. Um, yep, definitely Socratic, Matthew. And Harry, trust me, you're never going to be right, ever. It's not going to happen. 
Um, I'm Harry Tom used to that. <laughs> I'm going to take the fifth on that one, shall I? Because I know that this is being recorded. And I hope nobody shows this to your wife, because uh, you're going to be in trouble. OK, um, I'm going to stop the recording now.